Hey everybody, Larry Powell here, your host for Studio HFL, and this is a reissue of my interview with Kathy Leach when she was still teaching at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. This interview was in 2018. Since then, of course, Kathy has retired and is enjoying retirement, uh, living down there in the hills of Knoxville. And uh, so now you have the transcript, and of course this is now available on YouTube, which is why you're watching it here on YouTube. Hope you enjoy this. Messina Covers is not just any other case company. David Messina and Erica Howard design and produce some beautiful cases that fit both form and function. And you can choose your case design, fabric and trim color, add custom engraving, and more. And of course you can find out more at MessinaCovers.net. Peter Pickett and his crack team of craftspeople are continually innovating and providing the trumpet community with spectacular options for stock and custom mouthpieces. He and Eric Murin can help you find just the right size to fit your needs, and you should definitely consider trying the acrylic cup and rim. And if you're in the market for a custom trumpet, then Peter and Eric can build a Blackburn trumpet just for you. Check them out at picketblackburn.com. To stay current on what's going on with Studio HFL, you can follow me on social media on Facebook and Instagram, and you can watch the live and pre-recorded interviews on the YouTube channel. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. My first experience with a Hammond Design mouthpiece has turned into a bit of obsession. There is something very comfortable about playing one of Carl's mouthpieces. The comfort, response, and sound are part of the HD experience. Try one of the stock mouthpieces or have Carl make you a custom one. Either way, everything is better in HD, and you can find out more at carlhammonddesign.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you are, I would love it if you would take just a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts to leave a star rating and a review. Doing so will help improve the visibility of this podcast and draw more listeners. When I first tried an Eastman B-flat trumpet, I was blown away by both the playability and the sound. And the more I found out about the company and got to know the people, I knew that this was a company I wanted to have a relationship with. There is a drive for excellence in design and production of every instrument, not just the high-end products. And the proof of this is that the one and only Doc Severinsen helped to design the Eastman Beginner trumpet model. I still play that B-flat and have added a spectacular cornet and flugelhorn to my arsenal. You can find out more at EastmanWinds.com. I'd love it if you'd visit the Studio HFL website and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And while you're there, you can also visit the merch page and buy a Studio HFL shirt for yourself and as a gift for someone else. Of course, you can do that at StudioHFL.com. My current situation with my C trumpet is a bit ridiculous. My Shire C, which Samantha Lane helped me trial and choose, is the most versatile C I've ever played. The same goes for the new Destino designed by Doc. This horn sizzles when I need it to sizzle and is as smooth as silk when I wear my sil- uh, never mind. Uh, anyway, the line of Shire's trumpets includes the Q series, which are production models, and the custom series. Either way you go, you'll love the sound you get, and you'll also experience exceptional customer service. Find out more at seshires.com. Here's how you can access exclusive content like the interview excerpts. I'd like to invite you to become a part of the Studio HFL community by going to Patreon and choosing from one of the four tiers of support. You can help to financially support the show for as little as $36 a year. That's only $3 a month. Benefits include exclusive access to interview excerpts, a behind-the-scenes report, an invitation to be in the room with a guest during an interview, product discounts, and more. You can join the community of faithful supporters by visiting patreon.com slash studio HFL. I hope you enjoy this podcast. And now on with today's guest, Dr. Kathy Leach. Here today with uh, Dr. Kathy Leach at the University of Tennessee, professor of trumpet, and welcome. Thank you very much. So I would like to get as much wisdom both trumpet-wise and music-wise uh, from you today. So for the next six hours, we're going to sit and... <laughs> just <Great>. kidding. <laughs> and the listeners just turned everything off, frankly. <laughs> um, no, I, I think what I'd like to do is start with uh, your current position here at the University of Tennessee. Tell us what your responsibilities are here, how long you've been here. You can go in any direction from there. Okay. 
Um, my position here is professor of trumpet, and I have been teaching here at the University of Tennessee since 1981, so that's 37 years. Wow. And I have just um, given up the position of associate director of undergraduate studies here. I did that for the last four years. And there was another period of time, I think 1999 to 2003, I was associate director of graduate studies. So um, I've done those administrative kinds of jobs for a total of eight years. Mm -hmm. And I'm also president of the ITG right now, the International Trumpet Guild. So um, I still have my administrative um, duties that way. There's something about trumpet players in administration that seems to be a natural fit. Lots of trumpet players are good at it. There are mm -hmm. lots of department heads and deans and um, whatnot. So I guess many of us are good at it. So you have the normal teaching load of applied lessons uh, for undergraduate and graduate level students? Yeah, I have 20 to 25 students, and that's a mix of graduate and undergraduate. I'll us usually have t anywhere from two to five graduate students. We don't have a doctoral program mm -hmm. here, so we have a, a master's program that includes um, across the school 100 or so 90 to 100 students, so it's a good size master's pool. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of things with a with 100 grad students. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I teach trumpet, I teach studio classes, and I teach uh, trumpet ensemble, various levels, and coach brass quintets. Mm -hmm. And we have a very active and fun faculty brass quintet here, so um, we rehearse twice a week and then do tours and concerts and whatever else comes our way. Wow, very busy. I'm trying to imagine how you took on the department responsibilities <laughs> on top of all that. <laughs> well, I, I like to learn new things and um, it was, it, it, I worked constantly, I can tell you that, mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, didn't sleep a lot. Um, but it, it is good to learn new things. I think if you're going to stay in the same job for 37 years, <laughs> it's important to do that um, and and just venture out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, notice that I always come back in. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. but I think that helps me stay um, sharp. So a lot of changes in 37 years. Um, I mean, that would be assumed that, of course, things are going to change, but uh, significant changes that you can think of? For me or for the School of Music or sure, both? Sure, or, or all of it, or, or in the students that, that come in through the your students. studio. Yeah, okay, all of those things, I guess. Well, for me, um, for the first 31 years that I was here at UT, I was also pr principal trumpet of the Knoxville Symphony, mm -hmm. and that's a 38-week season. Um, there's a, a full symphony season. There is a chamber season that is five series of concerts. Mm -hmm. There is a ba local ballet company and other ballet companies came in. There's a local opera company. There's a uh, five pops series. So that was every night, nearly every week. And so that was my two jobs mm -hmm. for most of my time here, which was great. Wow. Um, it, and at the time when I was doing that, uh, my colleagues, most of them here, were also playing in the symphony. Now, both organizations have gotten so busy and so demanding that um, there isn't anybody that, that is on the faculty here wow. at UT that's, that's playing in the symphony. They sub, mm -hmm. but there are no, no full-time members it used to be all of us. Demands all, are too great both ways, correct. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And so there used to be a nice um, input from both sides, a nice nice collaboration. There still are collaborations. Like uh, our, our building is right next door to the Clarence Brown Theater. And um, some of the most memorable performances that I've had here involved the symphony's collaboration with the UT's Clarence Brown Theater we did um, a performance of um, a, a long run, three and a half weeks or so, of um, Amadeus. We did a performance of Hamlet. 
um, that involved the musicians sitting on big scaffolding and used the music of um, Shostakovich and um, Tchaikovsky and others. I can't remember who um, right at the moment, but it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And this fall, they're doing Candide. With the with the university. Oh, of course, company. with the Bernstein mm-hmm. hundred yes hundredth anniversary. Yeah, so um, there 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 has been a great a great collaboration between mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. symphony and um, and the university. So um, now we're all kind of busy over mm-hmm. here to the point that you know everybody plays a lot, but mm-hmm. we don't have really the time to to be in the symphony full time. So that quintet anymore. is a nice outlet. Oh, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I love my colleagues, um, the brass especially, all my colleagues, really. Um, and they are, now I find myself being the the elder states person <laughs> of the quintet by 20 years at least mm-hmm. and 30 in even more cases. <laughs> so that's, I'm sure it's interesting for them and um, but it's really fun for me. Mm-hmm. I can keep up with them. So terrific. Yeah. Uh, standard rep and new repertoire, or um, in the quintet, yeah. Um, we've we try to have uh, do something new each 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 concert. I mean, newer repertoire. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes we lose the the student audience when we do that, mm-hmm. but <laughs> we're gonna keep keep doing it. Mm-hmm. And you know, a mix of a mix mix of standard repertoire mm-hmm. as well and I like to arrange so um, oh, nice. I've done a couple of arrangements just for them mm-hmm. and more coming out so it's interesting on on my way down today I was listening to podcast and uh, Rachel <laughs> Rodriguez yeah uh, now at uh, UNT yeah um, terrific for her terrific for that school mm-hmm. but she was talking about uh, seraph brass mm-hmm. and they're gonna and be here this they fall. all arrange I think nice. she had said in that podcast they all arrange their solo works with that group and I thought that was really interesting and it seems to be that way a lot of places where people are less fearful of taking on the arranging responsibilities and some really nice creative things yeah I think come out of that yeah I, I really like doing it and um, and they so far have liked playing the, the the things I've arranged, and that is what I have focused on mainly is arrangements of things that can be used as solo features. And you don't give yourself the melody the entire time, right? No. Well, I I did a, the Sanson Romance for French horn, which is a, a French horn solo, with the for the purpose of giving her something that would feature her, mm-hmm. our, my horn colleague, Katie Johnson Webb. And um, she sounds beautiful on it. Very and, nice. Um, so, yeah. Let's, of course, now we're going to have to go back mm-hmm. a ways. Before uh, University of Tennessee, mm-hmm. um, where were you before this? Uh, were you in another position in an orchestra, teaching elsewhere, coming out of school? What was going on? I was coming right out of school, uh, except that I I got my master's in May of 1981. You can edit that out, too, if you want. But Maybe. I already said it, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so at, the day after I graduated with my master's, I went to Mexico to play second trumpet in the Toluca wow. Symphony. So for that summer, I was second trumpet in in the in that orchestra good experience with that tremendous experience fantastic orchestra half the orchestra was american um and just as a cultural experience it it toughened me up Mm -hmm. and um at the time it was very lucrative also uh they paid very very well after i i left the peso fell Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have been quite so good mm-hmm. an experience for earning money but I wouldn't I wouldn't replace that experience for anything mm-hmm. it was it was hard sometimes um, but I was I'm glad that I did that what kind of repertoire I'm, I'm curious a standard mm-hmm. um, it was the conductor was Enrique Batis who's quite well known for being pretty tough 
and they don't have union down there. So so he would show up an hour late for rehearsal, and then oh he just had to stay there until he was done. Mm-hmm. And um, so all kinds of things happen that can't happen here, mm-hmm. thankfully, because of the musicians union. Mm-hmm. So um, and and met lots of people that um, I still know. I, I was playing second to Chuck Bergens, who's principal in Phoenix. And um, now, mm-hmm. and so still run into him sometimes. Mm-hmm. So that was your summer right out of your master's? That was my summer right after my master's. And, of course, now you can't get a job like this with just a master's. So I, 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 I taught um, here. Um, I started, and I was 25 years old when I started teaching here. And... After 15 years of teaching here, I I love the job. That's what I've always wanted to do: is mm-hmm. teach teach college trumpet. And um, but after 15 years, I started thinking, well, I need I I think I'd like to go back to school. So I did, because so many things had happened. Computers had happened. I did all my <laughs> master's papers on a typewriter, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll provide a link. Uh, to a picture of a typewriter for those listeners who might not know exactly. <laughs> yeah, what that is. And who would want to do a paper on a typewriter? It's a, it's so great to have computers, but mm-hmm. all the research had changed. And also, after teaching for fifteen years, I thought I don't know if I can do this another fifteen years without some um, influx of inspiration and learning mm-hmm. and all that. So I got a leave of absence for a year and packed up and moved to Chicago to sh- study with um, Vince Chickowitz. I'd always wanted to do and I wanted to do it before he retired. Mm-hmm. And I got in just, just before, I think it was his last year. Terrific. So um, I did, I was up there for a year and just blew through all the classes in a year. And then I had to go up another year to take trumpet lessons in the summer. Um, but uh, I finished the doctorate in 2002. I was already tenured here. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like I needed to do it except for purposes of being here. I was mm-hmm. already tenured. Mm-hmm. But um, but I wanted to do it just to learn some more. Mm-hmm. And it was it refreshed me teaching-wise to be able to study with, with Mr. Chickowitz and um, and artistically I could listen to the Chicago Symphony anytime I wanted and um, it's a good thing so you got to hear Bud Herseth and yeah and uh, mm-hmm. well I'm, okay I'm gonna edit this part out because I'm drawing a blank on uh, <laughs> um, Friedman Mark, Jay Friedman you know of course is still there yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. trying to think of Clevenger and yeah like the brass section the brass section yeah Charlie Vernon on bass trombone mm-hmm. so yeah it was terrific mm-hmm so that's very insightful to know that mm-hmm. you're a Chickowitz student and not a trickle down like a lot of us are. You know, you were a direct I, student. I, I was. I never studied with Arnold Jacobs. That's something I regret, but mm-hmm. like everybody else did. Mm-hmm. But um, but I glad that I was able to study with, with Mr. Chickowitz mm-hmm. and and my my teacher before him, my undergraduate teacher was Clifford Lilia, and he's long since mm-hmm. passed away. But he was just the best for me. What school was this? That was University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was where I got my undergraduate degree. And he, um, I think a lot of people may not know of him now, but he had such a long line of students who loved him and um, people that were out in the profession. Mm -hmm. Um, And he, his whole method of teaching was very patient, very common sense, nothing that I would consider weird. He used analogies a lot, like pearls on a string. Mm -hmm. He would describe tones. And um, it was just, for me, perfect. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved studying. Did you go to that school specifically to study with him? Yes, that uh, to study with him and for the band program mm-hmm. there, um, th- which was very famous at the time and um, still is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I wanted to see if I could do it. Um, I went there, when I went there, 
um, my freshman year was the third year they had allowed girls in the marching band. So there were 32 females in the band. I was one of them. And 300 and something males. <laughs> And, um, and, and to even talk about that, even for you to say that right now, I'm, I'm still thinking, how is that even possible? You know, of course, it framed was in the today, way it was. framed today, and I and I know yeah. there's still there's still a lot of issues, but yeah. uh, not not like that. Uh, yeah, it, it didn't really seem like an issue. Um, it was a little. It was a it was a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but but we didn't really have issues. I mean, I think they had been through the hard part of that before I got there by making the decision. Mm -hmm. I know that the first year they allowed girls in in the marching band, there were three. So I think those are the people. And And, and those other two are still your best friends, right? Those other two (laughs) were, I wasn't there yet, but the the two that, the other, the three Mm -hmm. were still in the band Mm -hmm. when I I got there. So they were reverenced. That's a Big Ten school, isn't it? Yeah. So you had to march Big Ten style. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm so thankful I never had to do that. Well, I, I loved it. It, it was it, I really did want to see if I could do it because I was from a little place in Vermont, t- town of 10,000. Our band was 55 members, and our, mm-hmm. our marching was, I mean, we'd walk somewhere and then we'd play and then mm-hmm. we'd walk somewhere else and then we'd mm-hmm. play and it was a, a tastefully done but it wasn't mm-hmm. anything like um, the marching that goes on here in Tennessee or Texas or Michigan mm-hmm. so I really was a beginning marcher mm-hmm. when I went into the Michigan marching mm-hmm. band and and so I just wanted to see if I could do it was this an education major or performance major? Uh, it was a music education major. So you wanted to do what with that degree? I Well, I thought that I would be a high school band director mm-hmm. and, um, and and was always and am still very dedicated to teaching. Um, but as I got through well, about junior year, I started thinking, hmm, there's a lot of fundraising that goes on with this job. And... <laughs> Um, I didn't know if I would be very good at that. Um, and I had just become more and more of a player in that I had gotten into the Toledo Symphony when I was um, a sophomore, I think, or a junior. What I can't remember which year it was exactly, but um, I was also in a professional brass quintet from the time mm-hmm. I was a sophomore there. And um, so I was playing all over the place. And I started thinking that I, well, I don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. So I took a year off between undergraduate school and whatever I was going to do next, Mm -hmm. which I wasn't exactly sure. I didn't know Mm -hmm. what school I wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching 40 students a week, private students, playing in the Toledo Symphony, playing in the Brass Quintet, um, which was Galliard Brass Ensemble, mm-hmm. led by a great person named Charles Larkins, who's still one of my best friends nice. in the world. And um, so at the end of that time, Jeff Piper in February, uh, I still remember, called and said, would you like to audition for our graduate assistantship? It's at the University of New Mexico. And I thought, well... <laughs> okay. I, he, he had heard me play somewhere and, mm-hmm. and he had had some candidates for the job and wasn't happy with any of them and and um, he said well if you come down here and play I think you'll get the job so I did and um, yeah I really wasn't sure if I wanted to do that or mm-hmm. go to some big school like the New England Conservatory or, right. or something like that but um, it appealed to me because they seemed to need me and it was p- part of the job was playing in the faculty brass quintet and teaching at the university level. Mm-hmm. And of course that is gold on a, on a resume. So mm-hmm. when I finally did interview and started applying for jobs here, just with my master's degree and being 24 years old, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have looked at me if I hadn't had college teaching experience on my resume. 
So three pretty significant teachers that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Can you sure. maybe compare and contrast the, their teaching yeah. styles and how that's become part of your teaching style yeah. and how that's even evolved over the over time? Those those the ones I've mentioned are were my college teachers, and I've got some that I remember um, very very deeply and fondly bef that happened before mm -hmm. that. Should I go back yeah, to please. early, early teachers? Sure. Um, well, I was so lucky when I was a kid um, that there was a great trumpet player in, in the high school band that was, I think, five years ahead of me. So I was listening to him, and I got in the community band when I was 12, and he was up there playing first trumpet, <laughs> and I was, you know, playing second and third for a mm -hmm. while, and then I somehow got up to be playing beside him and, and sitting right next to him and hearing his great sound. He was a music major, became a music major mm -hmm. at Hart College. His name was Gary Partridge, and he just retired from Hart as a... He was conducting, and mm -hmm. he still runs music festivals mm -hmm. in the in New England. Um, so I heard his sound. I, I was in the community band, so I was hearing older players, which was great, reading mm -hmm. every week, which was great. My when I was a freshman in high school, um, we got a new band director who was a trumpet player, and he had been to West Point in the band there, and um, he taught me um, as often as he could, mm -hmm. um, and started me on solos like Napoli and um, the Kennan Sonata, and he'd just give me stacks of music, and I'd go through it, and and he'd help me with it. Mm -hmm. But I was playing Napoli when I was fifteen with mm -hmm. the high school band, probably. I didn't know it was hard then. <laughs> now it's amazing it's what you do when you don't know <laughs> yeah, the difficulty of something, right? Yeah. Um, so I was lucky again um, to have a high school band director that was a, um, a trumpet player and mm -hmm. took an interest in me. And, um, and um, so uh, his name's Malcolm Rowell. He became the band director at University of Massachusetts, and he's retired now mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then um, the University of Massachusetts, there was a trumpet teacher named Walter Chestnut, who's no longer living, but he was a personality. He was energetic. He was super positive. And when I was in high school, at some point, I started going down to work with him in the summers, and my mom would drive me down. It was an hour and a half down there from Vermont. And she'd go to the university bookstore, and I'd have my lesson. And, and um, you know, he, he got me interested in starting a sea trumpet. And he got me transposing. And there wasn't any orchestra for me to play in anywhere around there. So mm -hmm. I just learned how to transpose from the Bordoni book. Mm -hmm. and, um, but then when it was time for me to play in an orchestra... In college, I already knew uh, what I was doing mm -hmm. on the sea trumpet. And so I was extremely lucky to have him. He, mm -hmm. he really took me seriously as a player and pushed me. And um, You were obviously so. taking it very seriously. Oh, always. Well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was from, from kind of day one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the, I remember when I was in sixth grade, I had a solo with the elementary school band, and it was, I think, Serenade for Trumpet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I got to stand out in front of the band and play. And we finished the concert, and the guy that was the head of the community band came up and said, well, you're a real musician, aren't you? And I said, yes. <laughs> so, and I remembered thinking, well, obviously, but um, yeah, so I did always think of myself that way. And um, I think partly because my grandfather played trumpet and violin, and I actually started on violin mm -hmm. too, so I kind of, I identified with him. Mm -hmm. My great-grandfather played trumpet and violin. But that was a and huge advantage before picking up the trumpet. So re reading music. Uh, yeah. Even before then, and having done some pretty major ear training with the, the yeah. violin too. And we had a piano in the house, and my mother, who's um, uh, just a really great teacher, she never was 
professionally a teacher, except she did work with some special ed students and as a substitute teacher. But um, she just leave a piano book, a kid's piano book, out on the piano, and until I was begging, can I do that? Whatever it is, and then she would teach me. Nice. Yeah. So those were your. Those are my early teachers. Early. Okay. And then this, this, the the three that I've mentioned to you, my uh, uh, University of Mich- Michigan teacher, Clifford Lilia, as a university teacher, was. Um, brilliant in a very soft-spoken way um he had there's a book out now uh, trumpet technique that is a summation of all his um methods and it's again just what i think of as common sense (laughs) uh, material everything that a college trumpet teacher needed to know at the time i think there's been more not directed towards students necessarily but towards teachers um, no, well, it's directed towards students. Mm-hmm. It's a resource book for students, okay. and it's um, his teaching was uh, heavily uh, s- built around flexibility, which um, having good flexibility has gotten me out of a lot of profession playing jams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, um, he he was very patient, um, made sure that you had good fundamentals and uh, sound and uh, threw in orchestral excerpts all the time. Um, And just, I couldn't be more grateful Mm -hmm. for him. But when you had gotten there, you're not really, are your chops in pretty good shape? Do you have major issues that you're still trying to overcome or is this just fine tuning at this point? I did a lot of things right, um, but I had a very low embouchure that slipped down a little bit. And I, by the time I got out of Michigan, I had to change it. So that, that caused me some mm-hmm. consistency problems. Um, and um, I had it, always had a great sound, great musicality, but um, I was suffering a little bit range-wise. Um, piccolo trumpet was frustrating for mm-hmm. me. And so um, I think Mr. Lilia did not want to change me because everything, you know, not everything was right, but mm-hmm. a lot of things mm-hmm. were right. And I was having, I was having success. I had gotten into the Toledo Symphony as a, as a sophomore or junior, whichever it was. And I, I learned quickly and I adapted to orchestral playing very fast. Mm-hmm. I was a good soloist. I, was, I al- already had a lot of solo experience by the time I, I got there. And um, so he didn't want to change me, but I could see that I wasn't happy. So I found a teacher that um, would work with me on my embouchure because as that was James Darling mm-hmm. at, um, well, he was in the Cleveland Orchestra and played just about all the, I think his position was utility trumpet and he played mm-hmm. every position. And also a great soloist. And I had heard a recording that he did of the Kennan and Halsey Stevens. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I want to sound like that. So I, he was in Cleveland. I was in Michigan. And I went down there well, once a month um, for the year after I graduated from Michigan. And um, he, that change, he helped me move my embouchure up, which was an excruciatingly painful thing to do. Emotionally um, and physically, oh, probably. Oh, awful. <laughs> and... Um, I had it, it, I had a hard time doing it, but I was still playing in my quintet and still mm-hmm. playing in the Toledo Symphony, um, yeah. and I could I could still do that. Although sometimes it just felt <laughs> awful to me. But um, uh, James Darling helped me. Um, he said my musicality was way up here at a high level, and my range and endurance was kind of down much lower than that. Mm-hmm. And so I could equalize them by moving the embouchure up a little bit, and and I did. And that's allowed me to play things like the Bach B minor mass mm-hmm. and um, all the piccolo things that you need to do mm-hmm. as principal trumpet in a symphony orchestra. And um, So it, it all worked out. And mm-hmm. I guess with all the great teachers that I've had, you don't, I, I think you, you never get everything from one person, at least oh, I didn't. Right. Right. And um, that little bit of advice, take 
take what you what works for you and if it doesn't work for you forget it mm-hmm. and keep keep learning do you find any of his teaching style coming through mr lilia yes every day and um and it, it, i think especially i keep i heard him say one time something like the quick ones get it in four years and then I always wondered if I was a quick one. Uh, <laughs> but in, you know, being patient, just that little phrase um, has helped me every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think a lot of my teaching was based on his, his teaching. Mm-hmm. But I was also really glad. I at, In my master's degree, I studied with Jeff Piper, who was a Lilia student also. Oh. So that was kind of a continuation. And then, um, as I mentioned, my doctorate, I studied with Vince Chickowitz, who is... Vince Chickowitz. Vince Chickowitz. <laughs> and right. I was so glad that I had the chance to do that. Mm-hmm. And I got a little bit more of the in-your-face kind of playing, although I kind of always did that. Um, but just the blowing uh, mm-hmm. focus mm-hmm. of him was... Great. Of all of your teachers, did a lot of them play quite a bit in your lessons? Interestingly enough, the um, did my teachers play? Um, no. At the middle one did in my master's degree teacher, Jeff mm-hmm. Piper, because and I was playing in a quintet with him. Mm-hmm. But Mr. Lilia did, was not playing. Um, I'd hear him from outside the door, sometimes between students, Mm -hmm. he would pick up his horn and do a few passages of something. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chickowitz, I never heard him play a note on a trumpet. Wow. He buzzed, but even that, very rarely, Mm -hmm. very rarely. And he told me once he had picked up a trumpet a couple of weeks before that lesson, and he said it felt heavy to him. (laughs) So, So, no. And I, I think, I think that is interesting because those are two of the greatest teachers both of those people Mm -hmm. thought as two of the greatest teachers there were and I don't think you find that now you don't it's not really possible to be a college trumpet teacher now without playing Mm -hmm. or it's much less possible Mm -hmm. um well, you know, I think about the students that come through and, and their learning styles and those that are that respond to the, the modeling and those that respond strictly to instruction and those that who are more tactile. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, so you think about somebody who comes through and, and would really benefit much better from having it modeled mm-hmm. might not have not, might not get as much out of those lessons with those same professors that you had. Yeah. But scores of people did. Mm-hmm. Um, and because those teachers were that good, they were that good, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, you could get what you needed, mm-hmm. and they were also extremely experienced. That was a good Have thing. you had lessons since Mr. Chickowitz? A few, uh, not not too much lately. Mm-hmm. Although um, I here in my house. Um, <laughs> what 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 is a trumpet lesson? Just about every sure. day. Um, I'm trying to think the last. But oh. you mentioned earlier, even if you're not seeking uh, teachers, but you you you're still listening. are growing because you were talking about things that you like to do. Um, what are some things that keep you moving forward and keep you energized and interested and excited about the trumpet? Um, well, certainly um, lots of things. Listening, uh, you hear somebody and, and again think, I want to sound like that or I want to play that or um, I'd like to do that. Um, having having things in front of you to play, like quintet recitals and, and your own recital. I haven't done as many solo recitals um, lately, but I'm still doing them. Mm-hmm. And that's always a such a stimulating thing. Well, when I saw you back in March, you were working on Tony Plough's postcards, I believe. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I and I ended up not playing that. Um, and I can't exactly... I think the program was too long. But I did play um, two recitals this spring for trumpet festivals. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, and I like to do that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, playing in church or 
playing weddings by yourself and um, all that is is still a, a recital, solo mm-hmm. recital. And so church playing is very stimulating mm-hmm. to me. Um, so I like to do that. Um, certainly being part of the International Trumpet Guild is super inspiring. And part of the work, what I like about working for um, ITG right now as president um, is just that I get to work with everybody like you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, it that's very inspiring to see what everybody else is doing what's possible to mm-hmm. do and everybody's doing something a little a little bit different um, and you know keep coming up with projects that that you want to work towards like I'm I'm thinking about doing a recording of arrangements of lullabies from around the world set for trumpet and a great idea well it's an idea whether it stays in my head or <laughs> it makes it to to a, mm-hmm. a piece of paper and then mm-hmm. a recording we'll see mm-hmm. but you know ideas keep coming up and you just try and find the the minutes to mm-hmm. s- to work on them listening you mentioned mm-hmm. um let's go yeah. all the way back and not counting your very first teacher mm-hmm. that you were saying was uh, sitting at the section, mm-hmm. top of that section. Um, and was it your father or grandfather who was the trumpet player in the house? Um, well, my father did play trumpet, but he was a dentist. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I never heard him play the mm-hmm. trumpet, but I started on his trumpet. Oh, on his um, trumpet. I, okay. Yeah, and I still mm-hmm. have that trumpet. Um, but who... But, who did you listen to? Who can you think was, oh, that's the first trumpet player I remember hearing? Well, at the at the time, um, again, my, my teacher, Walter Chestnut, would load me up with records. When I'd go for my lesson, he'd give me a record to take home and bring back, and then I'd, he'd give me another one. And mm-hmm. it was Maurice André um, that was the person to listen to mm-hmm. at the time. And, and Doc. Um, sure. So... I think one of the first albums that I bought was a Doc album. <laughs> it had the theme music from the summer of 42 on it mm-hmm. and um, still have that album. And really, that's who I listened to. And Maurice Andre, I mean, that that made an impact mm-hmm. um, to hear to hear him. And, I, and then my teacher, Walter Chestnut, mm-hmm. would listen to him. Mm-hmm. And um, would watch the Boston Symphony on TV once a week when mm-hmm. it was on. Um, and beside that, you were kind of limited to the people in your town. Because mm-hmm. we certainly don't have we the didn't, ac- have, didn't have the access then as no. we do now, instant mm-hmm. to YouTube or wherever to get that. Yeah. Um, who do you listen to now? Who who really? gets you inspired to pick up the horn again? Um, well, let's see. I'm, I'm pretty much inspired to pick up the horn <laughs> most of the time. But um, my favorite people, I, I love Hardenberger. Mm-hmm. I love um, listening to Tina uh, and mm-hmm. um, Ting Helseth. She's, mm-hmm. she's wonderful. Um, I mean, so many, really. Um, Chris Martin. Uh, mm-hmm. Symphonically, um, let's see. Those are some of my favorites. Um, Any I particular style of music that you're drawn towards? I I like a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. I loved the orchestral repertoire mm-hmm. and and um, kind of miss the music. But um, solo wise, I like the French. Um, kind of repertoire. So let's talk about that. When you work up uh, Jolivet or anything along that line, do you really envelop the style or is it more personal interpretation? Well, I I try to be in the ballpark. Um, You know, after listening to a lot of French players like uh, Andre again and um, Eric Obie, um, try to get, and then other other nationalities playing those pieces, mm-hmm. um, then come up with something that's me. That's that style seems to 
fall naturally for, for me. It was it was easy for me to pick up that style. Germanic be a little harder mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd say the combination of a little bit of me, but you know, staying mm-hmm. in what's appropriate articulation wise and um, dynamic wise. Not and, swinging. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Although there's some jazz in there, but oh sure. Uh, well, the Ubo Sonata. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The last movement has. Yeah, uh, uh, that's another piece I really, really mm-hmm. love. And right, right now, the, I've been doing so much administrative s- stuff. I was, I when I judged at NTC last year, I I wrote down all the pieces that were in the finals where that I was judging, mm-hmm. and a lot of them I don't know. I can recognize them, mm-hmm. but but they're new. And I haven't played them. So right now I've got a list of, say, 15 things, 15 pieces of music that I need to order because I haven't played them. <laughs> and that all happened probably in the last seven years mm-hmm. that um, while I was doing administrative and now the the being president of the ITG, there are a whole bunch of new solos. that. Well, see, that, that answers playing. the question uh, from a few minutes ago about what... You know, yeah. and I know you're inspired to pick up the horn every day, but you know, it's like I want to play that. You, yeah, so and, and you hear it, and you keep growing. It's something new. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, if I hear these solos that are so intriguing, I want. I don't want to just listen to them. I want to play them, mm-hmm. even if I never perform them. I want to play them mm-hmm. because I feel like I know them better mm-hmm. that way. Well, and you might have a student eventually that you think yeah, that okay. would be the perfect solo for them. Re- ex- yeah, do. that's ex- that's mm-hmm. true. That's very true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about your time in the symphony, mm-hmm. uh, in the Knoxville Symphony, uh, principal player. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of demands? Uh-huh. I think you alluded to the B minor mass earlier. Is that something that you did? We did several mm-hmm. times. Yeah, um, it's it, first trumpet is is a heavy load. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's um, I, the last conductor that was here for ten years, uh, Lucas Richmond said to, to me, "Your job is such a tightrope wire, like being on a tight tightrope wire." And I said, "Well, I try not to think of it that way, but yeah. he's absolutely right because mm-hmm. you're you you have such hard playing sometimes with a full symphony concert, depending on what the conductor chooses for mm-hmm. repertoire, and it can be." four or five really, really hard pieces. Um, and then the next, right after that, you might have to play something with a very small orchestra in a very small room and that's very soft and <laughs> right after you're all mm-hmm. blown out. Mm-hmm. And so it, it was a constant um, thinking about chops and planning and... Um, pacing mm-hmm. and strategizing how to okay how am I gonna you know mm-hmm. get through this and then go to this and mm-hmm. and so it was it was great um memorable performances quite a few I would imagine yeah those uh collaborations with the mm-hmm. with the theater company that I mentioned were very, I still remember those a lot. All the Mahler symphonies, I remember. You've gotten to play all of them. All of them. Mm-hmm. And that's and unique. That's when I started thinking about retiring, because I <laughs> said, "Well, I played all the Mahler symphonies and some multiple, multiple times." Mm-hmm. So I and and that to me is the peak of being an orchestral trumpet player. Mm-hmm. There is nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Bet nothing better than that to me, mm-hmm. and in and within a Mahler symphony, you get all of that. You get to play loud. You get to play soft. You get to play te- technical things. You get to play beautiful melodies. You get to play staggeringly hard interval leaps. Sometimes mm-hmm. you get to play by yourself. You get mm-hmm. to play trumpet trios, and it's it's everything. I'm curious out of, out of the Mahler's uh, uh, the first symphony, the second movement, original second movement, I think that was taken out, the Blumina. Have you ever gotten to perform that? You know, I didn't. None of none of the performances. So you have to go back now. I just didn't want them. But they've okay. done it here with the university orchestra, mm-hmm. and and had you know I've had students that have played that. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. And I kind of wonder why he took that back out of there, but yeah. nobody asks me yeah. for my opinion on no. those, <laughs> those sort of things. My conductors didn't ask yeah. me either. You want to play that? They didn't. 
So, uh, you know, you're looking at the season ahead and maybe planning out, you know, how you're going to approach yeah. things. Were there ever pieces on there that you thought, oh, my goodness, I'm in trouble? Um, yeah, but I would, I mean, every year when this next season was announced, my entire summer before the season was dedicated to learning the whole season. Mm. So I had, I'd have a rotation going, which, you know, that was great too, because I was so organized and motivated. I would learn all the, the whole season. Well, that's brilliant because you're teaching at yeah. the same time. So yeah. you're not going to have I don't have time to learn time. it during the year, that's brilliant. except I have time to revisit it, but mm -hmm. I don't have time to learn it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd, I'd put on Herseth recording and play along, you know, with the Mahler Symphony mm -hmm. or Strauss or whatever mm -hmm. we were doing. And I'd learn all the stuff that I could see that I that I knew about mm -hmm. that I could get get hold of mm -hmm. in the summer. And um, that worked. And then I could just review it when it was closer to the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then you can make all decisions decisions about what horn am I going to play this on and what mouthpiece am I going to play this on if if it, if it was mm -hmm. a, a pickle thing or, um, and not have to be worrying about that in the, in right. the heat of having <laughs> students all day and right. all that. Uh, the trumpet ensemble you have here at UT, is that... Uh, Part of the studio? Is that a requirement yeah. that they are, are part of that? Yes. I, I I mean, when the students that I have come in here maybe have had trumpet lessons, maybe haven't Some in some cases. And so they're, many of them, their entire experience before they come here has been playing in a band, a high school band, which is great, but it's not everything. And so I, I say you either have to play in a chamber ensemble, which can be a trumpet ensemble, or have a duet partner every semester in order to get a passing grade so that they develop ensemble skills. And um, so we have once a week set aside for trumpet ensemble. And it's a pretty good length, over an hour and a half mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. And um, I have found it important to take them to ITG as often as possible and play a prelude. Um, and I've taken a trumpet ensemble to NTC three or four times. Mm -hmm. And this year, NTC is in Lexington. So right up the road. So hoping to get some soloists mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ensemble or two there. I'm amazed. I knew you were doing a lot, but I'm amazed to hear uh, the extent of all of that. And it's it's quite impressive. And uh... Well, I'm not doing as much as I used. I mean, I'm doing a lot. But, but I mean, the job in itself is enough. The university, not, not even yeah. taking on the ITG duties. Yeah. Or even the administrative responsibilities in the, the department. And, and looking back at the orchestra thing, I don't know how I did that. Mm -hmm. Every Everyone else here was doing it too. Mm -hmm. um, the, But I don't know how we did that. Because mm -hmm. uh, just you'd go home for half an hour, feed your dog, have a little <laughs> sandwich, and come back in for... Mm -hmm two and a half hour, three hour rehearsals. So. One thing we haven't talked about is uh, kind of a maintenance routine or a daily routine, something that you, um, tell me a little bit about that. Um, yeah, maintenance routine I think is so important. And of course it evolves throughout your life. Um, and um, depending on who you're talking to, you might pick up one little thing from somebody and, um, but my main, my routine now for the uh, last couple of years has been um, I, I, I do a little, little, little mouthpiece buzzing to just get things going. And I like Bobby Shue's flutter. Do you know Bobby Shue's flutter where he just does like a horse? No. That's his beginning well, I didn't know of that came moment. from him. Okay. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know if it originally came from him, mm -hmm. but he's a big proponent of sure. that. And... Um, so a little fluttering, a little deep breathing, a little, um, I do a little, a condensed T-bow mouthpiece, um, thing combined, T T uh, Pierre oh. T-bow, French. <laughs> Sorry. Not, I was not thinking Tim, Tim T-bow. <laughs> <laughs> no. I might have to Tim. leave that in just for comic effect. Pierre. 
<laughs> so I have a, a two-page Thibaut routine. I don't know if you've seen the three books by Pierre. Yes, thank Not you Tim. for clarifying. Thibaut. I can just imagine French. you, uh, you know, after you finish uh, <laughs> uh, one of the exercises is, uh, you know, genuflecting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but uh, the three books the, you were mentioning, yeah, the, about Thibaut. Uh, three Thibaut books. That's kind of a lot to do. So, um, the, uh, there's a guy was at Shires, um, Jeff Shamu. Did you ever meet him I don't know at that the name. Shires company? He had studied with Pierre Thibault in France, and so he he had a two page routine of Thibault that gets you into pedal tones, and 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 it's two pages instead of three books. Mm. So um, I find that a uh, valuable thing for me. And then there are two pages of of Cl- the Clifford Lilia book, which is mainly lip slurs mm-hmm. that I do. They're not tremendously difficult, but they get you flexible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then stamp, not about a 20-minute stamp routine. That's my routine. But I'll pick up things like... Um, uh, Vinny DiMartino mm-hmm. will come forth with some <laughs> some nugget of right. gold. Mm-hmm. And and one thing he said one time that I started trying was he his idea about starting on G above the staff that you should play that should be your first note. And I thought at the time I thought that was really strange, but I started doing it. And by golly. Um, then you don't feel like the notes above that are so high. Mm. And so I've I've started doing that. My first mouthpiece note is now an F concert. At fifth, the top fifth of the Fifth line. Fifth mm-hmm. line, yeah. Mm-hmm. And go from there. First note on the horn is an F concert. On fifth, at top of the staff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and my range has gone up. And I think that's partly because of that, partly mm-hmm. because of the T-bow exercises. And mm-hmm. I don't know. You eventually figure things out. (laughs) Very nice. This has been wonderful to sit and talk with you and and to hear everything you've had to offer. And uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, contributing to this podcast. And uh, I hope to hear you play again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's interview. Hope you enjoyed it. And please remember to like and comment at the podcast platform. And once again, just a reminder, if you'd like to financially support this podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash studio HFL. Again, thanks for listening. Now, time to go practice.